Hi, hello everyone. Thank you, thank you for joining um, this amazing room on, on digital health. Uh, it's gonna be a very interesting session and because we are running a little bit late, I'm um, gonna go straight to it. So um, just as, an, as, a, as a quick introduction of the presenters that we have today, um, we're gonna have um, Nanjira Sambuli and Dicky Settle presenting uh, Transform Health Coalition it, which is going to be a very interesting discussion on how they've managed to collaborate with different stakeholders around the world and from different sec um, sectors. We also have uh, Mariana Negrao, and apologies if I'm uh, pronouncing that wrongly, um, but she's going to be telling us about her experience in Brazil uh, on promoting respectful maternity care through digital health um, uh, through an initiative called Midwife, Midwife Checkmate. Um, and last but not least, we have Vitus Atanga from UNFPA, who will be presenting uh, some, some innovative um, initiative that they have as well uh, going on. So, uh, without further ado, I'm just going to let the presenters uh, show us what, what they have. And um, if we can welcome Diki Seto and Nanjira, I will just set up. Okay. There we go. So, um, Diki and Nanjira, please go ahead. And by the way, uh, just before that, please uh, ask questions through the chat. Uh, this is meant to be a very interactive session. The, the presenters are ready not only to answer your questions, but they also want to, to hear your thoughts and to, and to hear what you have to say about their ideas. So use the chat room. We will be uh, having this interaction uh, after the pre presentations. And thank you again, everyone. Over to you, Nanjira and Diki. Wonderful. Thank you so much. And it's really a pleasure to be able to join the session today. Uh, I'll start really quickly. My name is Nanjira, as you've heard. Along with uh, Diki, my esteemed co-chair, we are here to present about a coalition that we have the pleasure of helping steer in this uh, new ways of working uh, and new ways of doing things. So our coalition is called Transform Health, and our tagline is Health for All in the Digital Age. We are, and Mihal, after this, you can actually, uh, thank you, you can actually get remove that and we'll come back to it later. We do want people to see us and have conversations. <laughs> so we are a global coalition and movement championing a very lofty goal of achieving universal health coverage in the next 10 years, um, leaving no one behind as a sustainable development goal mantra goes. Uh, we want to see transformation in the health sector that ensures everyone has access to equitable, affordable, and high-quality health care. Now, to, to do this, we do want to see uh, data and digital transformation harnessed appropriately and in respect of human rights to support achieving uh, UHC by 2030. Um, and we also underscore the agency that young people and women have and that must be incorporated in every step of the transformations to come. For us, principles of equity, empowerment, partnership, inclusiveness are essentially non-negotiable. Dickie, anything else you want to add about who we are? Dickie, you're still on mute, unfortunately. <laughs> Thank you. Somebody had to do it first. Yay! <laughs> All right. Um, so, yes, uh, the coalition is really pretty exciting. And, and what I like to keep in mind is um, it was conceived as really part of a trifecta. We were um, part of three uh, related, interrelated initiatives that uh, Fondazione Batnar uh, has really catalyzed to um, have us begin uh, thinking about and organizing and really, really uh, making a transformation in the way that digital is happening. And, and transformation is a word that I uh, anticipate you're going to hear quite a bit. It's in our name. <laughs> um, and so the coalition was um, intended to be part of uh, three uh, with two other groups. One of those is a Lancet Financial Times Commission governing Health Futures 2030, which is underway right now. And, and for those of you familiar uh, not familiar with Lancet uh, commissions, they are, tend to be time bound, tend to be a two year initiative of, uh, of, of a cross group panel who really begin to tackle an issue. And, and the big issue that this uh, uh, commission is tackling is about the nature of uh, what this digital age looks like. 
and what is going to be the lives of the citizens, the youth of today, who will live in that digital age? And uh, how can we really imagine what these health futures will look like? And what were the governance and policy structures um, that are going to need to be in place? So those recommendations are due to come out uh, in September of next year. And so well, what's often understood is these commission reports tend to go up on the shelf and not get used and impacted. And so part of the vision of Undats and Botnar in establishing the commission was to establish a coalition and partnership with it. And so the coalition, uh, part of what it will be doing is taking forward those uh, commission recommendations and helping to ensure they have life and really get implemented successfully. And so this pairing between a commission and a coalition is exceptionally powerful. The third leg of the stool is a research collaborative, um, sometimes called the CERN of AI that's being conceived in uh, Geneva, IDAR, the International Digital Health and AI Research Collaborative. And so these three things working together, the research, uh, the uh, time-bound commission, and the coalition are intended to really see a fundamental transformation, to move us past discussions of digital health, to imagine the future of health itself, health in the digital age. Um, so let's see, I'm gonna talk just a little bit about um, the policy, about the some of the policy and investment work that we're doing. And then, Nanjir, if I may, I'm gonna kick back over to you to talk about the Camp, uh, about the campaign that's at the very heart of what we're hoping to do. Um, so one of the big challenges we're all facing right now is data policy. This is related to the work in the commission that's really focusing on what uh, types of security, privacy, and data policy need to be in place. Um, but what the commission is going to be doing is really trying to understand what can we put in place as a legal framework that can really recognize the ownership and enable the ownership of health data by individuals who own that health data but really also establish the networks of trust that will allow them to share that data for the global good. We're seeing how important that is right now in COVID-19. But we can't let the emergency of pandemic or future health emergencies get in the way of the individual privacy, especially with data as sensitive as health data, especially when we start to extend that health data towards genomic data, the very data that makes us who we are. Um, so alongside that policy work, is also a work stream around uh, resourcing and investment. And this is really recognizing that historically the investments in the digital health, not quite health in the digital age, focusing just on the technologies and the opportunities to move the needle in health has been traditionally underinvested. Really, um, we're not seeing the kinds of investments that can enable countries to really build the capacities that they want and need to lead a fundamental digital transformation of their health system, to overcome the traditional barriers um, that they've been facing in achieving universal health coverage and really making sure that um, we can uh, overcome historical barriers of time and space that have gotten in the way of health equity and health access and all of the value that we hope to anticipate and hope to bring. Ideally, if you um, listen to the UHC 2030 campaign, within the next 10 years, current rates of uh, health worker production and retention, if we stick with traditional models, try to deliver health the way it's always been delivered, we're just never going to get there. There's just too few health workers. There are too many challenges in health commodity supply chains. There's just too many challenges across the health system that we believe can only be addressed by digital and data in combination with um, all of the excellent work that's been done. So we're hoping to set up that transformation. So Nanjar, I've talked too much. Um, let's talk about how that campaign is going to help make that happen. Yeah, at the heart of it is a campaign that will try and really is, is steered towards accelerating the current trend towards the digitalization of health systems. And I want to emphasize again appropriately because as much as we see a trend does not necessarily mean it's compatible in all contexts. So we want to see that acceleration happen to ensure that digital transformation supports and where possible minimizes and avoids any risks towards the achievement of uh, universal health coverage by 2030. Uh, and here, in, in uh, also responding to Estefania's great question, we are hoping to uh, influence key stakeholders, uh, in this case, especially governments and circles of policy making, but also private sector actors who tend to be the creators of innovations, especially in digital, and also, uh, you know, coalitions or groups that have been working either at advocating for human um, health and human rights or uh, health access more broadly, typically in the not-for-profit or NGO or civil society actor. But one core actor we absolutely have made sure, including in the 
setup of a coalition is heard is the youth. And we have a great youth, vibrant youth coalition that is the one that drives is actually our boss <laughs> in all of this, um, in everything that we do and think about as far as this goes. So the idea here is to influence and work with key stakeholders really to ensure these barriers to equitable and rights-based adoption uh, to, uh, of digital technology and data to achieve UHC are removed. And we want to show again to the great policies that Dickie was talking about, we can see great po effective policies, clearer uh, regulation and adequate levels of funding in place to enable all countries to expand their use of digital technology on this. Uh, lastly, on that, um, it's very related to how hope having governments um, understand the key role of ensuring that um, as long as, as, as we talk about uh, health, uh, we need to also have um, the investments, the requisite investments in the infrastructure, in the digital enabling infrastructure, right from internet access to electricity in some areas, and of course, literacy and digital skills for everyone uh, who will be involved in uh, consuming and, and receiving healthcare uh, through these platforms that we're talking about. Diki, do you want to have a word on how we work and how our coalition is set up? Sure. Thank you, Ninja. So I'm super excited about the way this um, coalition has been envisioned. We're really attempting to do an inclusive leadership model, a holacracy model that breaks down traditional hierarchies and really recognizes um, you know, the autonomy around work streams and to really facilitate a structure that allows for the formation of different uh, collaboratives, even within the larger collaborative carry forward individual agenda. We wanna make sure that this is collective and collaborative and agenda of the participants as possible. So we're using a holacracy model uh, through the establishment of circles of participants focused on the work streams. We've talked about the policy, data policy um, circle and focused on that work stream. There's also a resource and investment circle that's focused on uh, unlocking the next order of magnitude of investment in digital transformation of global health. We have a campaign circle that's really focused on the campaign that Nanjira spoke about. Uh, we have a network and engagement circle that's really looking at how we expand and bring in wonderful new members of the coalition, such as all of you, and uh, we'll get to that in a minute. And then finally, the various leaders of those circles come together into a governance and strategy circle that uh, help to really coordinate across those circles. But the intent is not that everything roll up to that governance and strategy circle to be managed, but really that we devolve and uh, delegate that power, that um, initiative, and that leadership out to the individual component work stream circles to really drive and lead their work stream. And while these are the starting circles, we certainly don't anticipate that these are uh, the last circles to be formed. As new members come in with new aspects of the new agenda and new priorities, we really hope to see new circles form and new collaboratives happen and really make this a, a diverse and rich and collectively led uh, coalition. So Nigeria, do we want to talk a little bit about how people can come in, start thinking about their uh, participating in circles and Yes, absolutely. Uh, and Mihal, I'll request that you bring back our cute little slide. <laughs> Very simply, we're still exploring before we launch uh, this coalition more publicly. But right now, one of the key things we are trying to make sure is that we have a sound baseline of what's happening everywhere across the world that we should keep an eye out for. So one way you can get involved immediately is by um, filling out the survey. And I'm going to copy the link again to on the chat uh, as that is not a clickable image, as well as a contact there shared for our coalition director, who you can also directly get in touch with. Um, in case of any additional questions. Else we do want to jump right into a conversation right now as I hand back to Dickie about some of the things we have presented uh, and some of your uh, emerging thoughts around this. And Dickie, I'm gonna hand back to you with some questions here that have already come in, which are brilliant. Thank you, Della and Adriana, on whether the model has been tested before and how COVID has affected our plans. Ah, thank you, um, Adela. That's a that's a great question on the model being tested before. So um, there is a book, uh, and for, forgive me for blanking on the author, it's called Reinventing Organizations that has uh, explored the holacracy organizational model, if that's what you're specifically referring to. And so that's worth checking out. Um, there's a one there. The book itself is over 300 pages. And I don't know anybody who is uh, going to be shaping organizations who has time to read such a thing. Thankfully, there is a much shorter, just over 100 page, much more 
visual um, summary of that book, and these are easily picked up uh, in either electronic or paper format. If um, that's the way you go. <laughs> uh, okay, what was the other question? How is COVID? Oh, COVID, right. Okay, you want to take that, Ninja, or should I? I can start and I can say I think what COVID has done for actors in the health and digital health sector is really brought that whole our work into the spotlight. So for us, I think it's maybe accelerated in a sense our, our, our understanding or sense of urgency around what needs to start getting done, uh, including shaping hearts and minds around what needs to happen. Because now that uh, the nexus of digital and health are being uh, explored or tested really through COVID, we have to make sure that we do not proceed with what would be a deterministic approach. You know, for example, we saw with contact tracing apps as this be all and end all. We are trying to make sure that there's a sound enough narrative that anchors the understanding that COVID as one pandemic is catalyzing the understanding and appreciation of what uh, role digital health uh, technologies can play and the how that will vary in different uh, sectors. Otherwise, um, it's still one of those, it's still very important to keep in mind for me, I found uh, that we, we must not let a moment determine uh, and for, wrongly determine our understanding of what needs to do. So keeping the long view is still very important and strategic on our end. Dicky, anything to add to that? So I, th I think you've captured it really well. What we've really seen with COVID is it's just so cast into such sharp relief. Uh, what we're seeing and needing in terms of effective health data for the public good, but it's also raising that debate to what degree and to what way uh, are we needing to use that data and to expose that data for the public good and yet also protect the rights of individuals. And what we're honestly seeing is Many, many social experiments. In the US alone, we've got 50 different social experiments and how to deal with a pandemic and to deal with those balances. And across the world, in the geopolitics of it all, we see many different approaches that different countries and cultures are taking to that balance of the individual sovereignty over their health data and the sharing and exposure of that data for the public good. And uh, it's gonna be fascinating to take what we learn. I mean, we'll be learning from the pandemic for many years after we've got it under control. Um, and even that's nowhere near inside to looking at the data again today, but uh, I believe many people do. Okay, what do we got? Seems we are, I don't know if we have satisfactorily addressed the questions posed already. Um, okay. But Della, I can also flesh in just real quick about whether the model has been tested before. I think it's always existed in some form or other way. Maybe we don't call them or use these kinds of terminologies. However, I think especially coming from a more digital sector or digital background, myself include, especially, I've seen that um, it's, it's been one sector that has helped people understand that there has to be a new way of working. So people are amenable to it because digital is not just something that has developed in a vacuum. It's very much related and you need the input, for example, from health practitioners before any Silicon Valley hood wearing tech bro builds any app ideally they should be speaking to health practitioners and that's what we're hoping to normalize not only in how we work but also in the narratives about the role of digital and data <laughs> and Mihail sorry I think I interrupted you there <laughs> no no worries that's that's great thank you Nanjira and Diki this, this has been uh, very great um, and very helpful to get your, your questions also from everyone. And um, I think um, it's great that you also shared your details and share how people can get involved with this uh, coalition and with the efforts that you're doing. I guess uh, with the emails that you shared there, people can contact you, ask more questions and keep the conversation going. Because um, this is what uh, this is all about. Uh, we really want uh, people to find out about these things and this uh, initiative so that we can really get engaged um, in the different responses that we've had. Um, so thank you, Diki and Nigeria, for an excellent presentation. Um, so in the in the interest of time, uh, unless you wanna you have anything else to add for closing, um, I can I can move uh, to our next presenter, uh, who is joining us today from from Brazil. Um, I actually don't know exactly from where, Mariana, you will have to tell us that in a minute. Um, but Mariana is going to share with us uh, the Midwife Checkmate Initiative. Um, this is for promoting respectful maternity health through digital health. So mm -hmm. it's also uh, going to be great to hear from you. And I invite everyone uh, in the conversation to keep throwing your questions, keep throwing your comments. It's very helpful for us and from the presenters to hear 
what everyone uh, has to say. So over to you, Mariana. Thank you. Hello, I, I, Santos, I think that is a, the, there's a bit of a mix up here. Mm -hmm. the, the midwife checkmate is going to be presented by Vitus from Ghana and not uh, Mariana. That's yeah, right, that's right. I'm I from apologize. TNH Health. Right, I'm sorry, so sorry. So Mariana, yeah, from, from TNH Health, and uh, I mean, I'll just let you, let you go ahead and, and present your initiative. And sorry about okay. that. <laughs> okay, it's okay. I'll do an introduction, so we're going to get that right. Um, let me share my screen. Um, I think I should put this on presenting mode. Is it better? Yeah. Yes, we can uh, see. It. So I'm uh, Mariana Negron. Someone said if they pronounce it correctly, but I'll take Mariana. Uh, I'm speaking from Sao Paulo in Brazil. That's where TNH Health is based. Um, so at TNH, we build digital health assistance for population health management in the form of, of chatbots. I work as head of product. I'm one of the founders and Vitalk is a product of TNH Health. So sometimes I'll refer to it as TNH Health. Sometimes I'll say Vitalk. It's all the same, kind of. Uh, my background is in electrical engineering, so if I say some, something that is clinically wrong, I apologize. But at TNH, we, we have a multidisciplinary approach to building uh, this digital health assistance. So I work with communicators, developers, healthcare professionals, um, and I'll, I'll tell you a little bit more about all, what we're doing. Um, so this is our vision. I really like that. Uh, our vision at TNH is to bridge the massive gap in primary care by putting a virtual health assistance in the pockets of millions of underserved patients around the world, thereby, thereby freeing up resources for human health care professionals to focus on those who need the most. Um, so it's we believe in the power of technology to enhancing the human power, the human resources in healthcare. So that's basically what we're doing. We do not intend to take out the healthcare professionals. We understand that they are a scarce resources that need to focus on those who need the human attention the most. And the, the main technology at TNH is a way of building engaging experiences in healthcare. And so we call that virtual health assistance for primary care, but it's basically, virtual conversations to engage and monitor big populations. Uh, so we do that through conversations. This is an example how we can send uh, like animated uh, GIFs and videos and uh, we, we can add buttons and we can wor work across platforms. Um, we also navigate patients through the most appropriate care so we can ask questions and understand what specific kind of care this patient should be target targeted to. So it's a little bit of care coordination as well. Uh, we also do monitoring and identification of risks and we can hand over the conversation to a human professional whenever needed. So, and so that's basically what our platform does. And we do that also using AI to, to do some uh, processing of natural language and understanding the intentions behind the patient's uh, intentions. Um, oh yeah, just to tell you a little bit more. So we've been doing that for five years now. We've uh, created many, many different chatbots in these years. We've worked with the pharmaceutical industry, with health insurances, with uh, even with clinical researches uh, to do like monitoring if there is a fever before, uh, if like a, for a vaccination of dengue. So we've we've created multiple uh, experiences for uh, monitoring patients in the last few years. And recently with uh, COVID-19, there was a big demand for this kind of, of product, as you can imagine. And our biggest partnership was with the Ministry of Health uh, in Brazil, right at the beginning of the pandemic. Um, so they, they partnered with different organizations for a monitoring system. And we, we, our, our product was focused on doing this initial triage on their website. So you can check your symptoms and if they understand that you need to escalate care, we collect your phone and then a nurse will call you. 
So that avoids people from going, uh, from leaving their houses first, if it's not necessary, so they can remain in isolation. And also they don't, don't have to go to a physical. Uh, I think there's some. Yes. Uh, but for, for COVID-19, we also did uh, different costs for other health insurance for municipalities because it's a different level of care. We did for health uh, state as well. So it, it's been an interesting time, although it's not a, not a very fortunate time for, for health care, but it's been an interesting time to see how, how this technology can be applicable. And uh, our main focus on TNH, because we spent like more than five years uh, monitoring populations, and then we understood that mental health is the basis of everything we do. Uh, even when we were moni monitoring chronic conditions, then we understood that we were talking about healthcare, we were talking about, uh, about mental health, we were talking about taking uh, care of yourself, and maintaining your routine and doing your checkups, maintaining a healthy diet. So we, um, and then we saw a lot of demand growing for mental health assistance and a lot of proved techniques that can be delivered digitally. So we created Vitalk, which is an AI powered virtual health assistant, mental, mental health assistant. Uh, and this experience is divided into three segments. We do a mental health checkup for big populations. Then we have, oh, so that's an organizational level, but also an individual level. Then we have a self-care self app. Uh, so that, that's basically a different digital interventions that people can do just using technology. And then we have uh, the conversation with a psychologist if, if the care needs to be escalated. So we have like these three different levels of care within the Vitalk experience. And of course, if we understand that there is something that cannot be addressed both through this platform, then we also have a way of escalating it, that for an emer emergency or other types of care. Um, so the first type of the first the first uh, level of the Vitalk experience is a uh, the mental health checkup with standardized questionnaires, and that's delivered in a in a fun way. Let's say, uh, so we took standardized questionnaires that have been proved and validated and translated into Portuguese in this case. And then we apply that for big populations. So this way that you can know exactly where you, you need to target you, uh, more population actions. Uh, we, do, we have implemented scales on depression, anxiety, burnout, stress, job productivity, and job stress. Uh, so that organizations can understand, oh, I need to target this segment or this uh, age range, or we can do like different uh, maps. But also on an individual level, they, they will receive they receive the um, a little card saying this is your level of burnout, this is your level of anxiety, risk for anxiety, right? And then they can seek uh, and what kind of uh, care they should seek based on that. So it's a very personalized feedback. And then we provide also organization insights. That, as I was saying, so we do a map for the organization based on. Um, different segments that they might have. We also try to look for a relationship between the factors, depending on the data. So that's very interesting for, for companies to do, for health insurance to do. Um, those are the majority of, oh, and also hostels for mental health professionals, which we have specific skills for that. Uh, it's anonymous and confidential. So uh, on an organizational level, you do not know which are the employees or collaborators or individuals that have responded to that, but we can address a specific, uh, we can say like in this area, in this age range, or in this level of your organizations. We also have a team of clinical experts that will offer insights and recommendations based on what is, what is found in your report. Then on the self-care, jumping to the second part, for that, that middle, the, the green, column, we have the, the app. So in the app, we have evidence-based psych psychoeducational exercises to promote self-care. 
and we do that through uh, care lines. So we have like a, a care line focused on relationships and also a little bit of what do you call confidence and no, uh, self knowledge. Uh, there's one on less anxiety, better mood, which is more targeted for depression, less stress. And then we did one specific on co how COVID-19 is affecting people. So we, we deal with things of isolation and dealing with loss and, and this type of subjects. Um, the core content has a mood, track team, mood, mood tracking, uh, cognitive restructuring, re relaxation, breathing, mindfulness, and positive psychology, it's all based on cognitive behavioral therapy. We also, um, we implement those scales on the checkup and then during these self-care programs, we also reapply the scale so we can see if people are uh, showing uh, progression or getting, getting better, so to say. So it's very interesting to say we, like 30%, 30% of the people will improve uh, their scores in one month. So it's very interesting to say we're, yeah, we're about to publish the results and then to run a more control, controlled um, research on that. But it, the, the results that we have so far are very interesting. Uh, what else? Yeah. And then uh, we, we also did a intervention specific, tar specifically tar targeted for healthcare professionals due to what's been changing the last few months for, for these people. We've partnered with the Johnson Johnson Foundation to target this population. So it's been a very interesting approach to how we can use this technology. Um, and then uh, the last part is asynchronous conversations with a licensed psychologist. We call it VTalk Personal because it's a more personal conversation. Uh, it allows for, a, there's also a checkup, but then different based on uh, the care plan. The psychology will work with you to develop a care plan. And then there's text-based therapy, which is being used for a few years now. Uh, but we do that using technology. So we are able to do that four or five times cheaper than traditional therapy, which makes it much more accessible for people and for organizations to provide to their population as well. Um, it's usually people will stay for uh, three months in, an, in, in, in a type of program. So it's very similar to how long a cognitive behavioral therapy will work. Um, and then we use the chatbot and the technology within the app to enhance the, the intervention that the therapist is doing. So they can suggest exercise, breathing exercises and positive psychology exercises that are already in the app. And that's why it's, we, get, uh, we, we can do that in a very cost effective way. And then, uh, so this technology is currently, so we have two pro white label projects on Vitalk, the, the ones that we, I was talking to at the beginning of the presentation. We have two projects in the US, but uh, the majority of our projects are in Brazil. Vitalk is available in Portuguese, but we are expanding it to Spanish in the next month. And we are also working with the um, Canadian government to expand that to pregnancy for Brazilian population. And we're exploring now to deal with, because we have this experience talking with uh, other conditions, we want to integrate that into the Vitalk experience. So specifically targeting diabetes, hypertension, and how it, by improving mental health, we can also uh, deal with challenges that people face when they have these chronic conditions. And that's it. I spent the entire, the entire presentation not looking at the chat, so I'll do that now. <laughs> no worries. Yeah, that, that's what I was going to say, Mariana. Thank you. This is, this is extremely interesting. And I think uh, while you were speaking, you were creating some reactions, in, uh, generating some reactions with the, in, the, in the chat box. So um, I think you've answered some of the questions, uh, such as what is the coverage in terms of usage? Um, so you have different countries, uh, you have different languages. Uh, there are also some other questions um, from Sahil Kopra. Um, from, I will read one from, from um, Kari Tamura right now, 
So it's mm -hmm. asking uh, if there is a way to verify the information that's being sent um, in, the, in the app. Yeah, it's all self-reported right now. And that's why we, we want to do a more controlled uh, in, analysis of what's going on. But uh, at this point, we do not confirm. But because we escalate care, then the mental health professional can confirm that directly with the patient if needed. That's, that's great. Mm -hmm. Okay, so um, there's also a question uh, from Sahil Chopra. Um, have we created linkages with primary health centers who are being identified as vulnerable or susceptible from this app? I'm not sure I understand the question. So I think it's, it's the linkages with the, with the primary health centers, if you have been in touch with them to, to serve, the, I guess, the needs that they have as well. Um, uh, yeah, yeah. Sahil, please feel free to correct me if I'm interpreting. Uh, no, I think, uh, yeah, you are right, I think. I'm asking this the same. So uh, what we're doing is that, uh, you know, we have been identifying, so suppose if I log into, into this application and, uh, you know, you see me as a susceptible or a vulnerable who may be getting, you know, mental health issues. So is there any provision of getting, you know, linkages with primary health centers or maybe other specialties or other counselors? So that is mm -hmm. what I'm trying to ask, you know, the linkages. Yeah. So the way we deliver this app is that we partner with organizations that have their own health systems. So for example, a, an employer or a municipality, and then we link that. So there's a, during the onboarding of the organization, we understand like, so these are the different outputs that, that we have to, and why, where should I send the patient to the user, right? It's not, not necessarily the patient the user in this specific situation. So we partner with these organizations to understand what's the best uh, care that we can provide to that person. Sometimes it's virtual, sometimes it's present. So it varies depending on who our partner is. Okay, thanks. Uh, um, uh, another question that I, that I think it should be, it's, it's interesting is um, if you can elaborate more about how does digital health assist mental health as there is increase of PTSD among young boys during COVID-19. And thank you, Jane, for this question. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I, yeah, there's a big challenge on mental health, both like from going through a pandemic, that's already something very big, but living in isolation, dealing with loss, uh, even like maintaining your routine might be very difficult during this. Uh, there's a lot of studies showing exactly what you, were, you, you wrote here about PTSD from what happened during SARS, so we, uh, the SARS epidemic. So we, we have studied a lot of what happened there with mental health and what we can anticipate that will happen in the populations that we're working with. So in this case, specifically Brazil. And there's a there's a lot of challenges and we, we still are going to face a lot of those we haven't gone through it yet we're still just we're still n not close to the end so uh we're still doing the stress phase i guess not full stress uh so there's and then mental health will affects health uh that's already known right so for example a diabetic person if they cost x a diabetic person with depression will co cost eight times X. So that's a huge burden on the health system. So we need to look at mental health also from a financial perspective. Thanks, Mariana. Um, so I'm gonna ask another, another question we have here um, in terms of funding and, and protecting patient data. Um, and also, just in the interest of time, because we're going to move for the next presenter, I, I would suggest if you can give some details, contact details of how they can contact you or how they can learn more about, about this. So if you can share in the chat your website or uh, any email that they yeah. can... Uh, I'll go ahead and share my last uh, screen, because there I had a, that's the TNH Health uh, website, and then that's my email. Feel free to send me an email, and then we can continue this conversation. Excellent. And um, so it, maybe we can go to the last question with the, with the funding and patient privacy data. Okay, so yeah, the way we finance this, uh, we do partnership with organizations, so employers will hire us to do it. But we also have a free app that, we, that it's free for use and anyone in Brazil can use it. Um, we also partner with municipality 
sometimes direct providing services directly, but there is a big challenge, uh, a bureau, bureaucracy challenge for doing that in Brazil. So we sometimes partner with foundations that want to bring that to population. So for example, uh, as I was saying, we partner with the Johnson Johnson Foundation for bringing that to healthcare professionals. And we have a partnership with the government, uh, the Can Canadian government to bring that to pregnancy, uh, to pregnant low income women. And we are open to partner with more organizations that want to explore further. Uh, because it's based on our technology, we, it allows for us to doing a lot of journey customization, which is very important in healthcare because depending on who you are and where you are, your type of care available varies a lot. So we take that into consideration. And then expanding a little more about privacy. We, we, the way we do is that we do not provide individual uh, information to, to the organization that we are working with unless we ask the patient if it's okay to do that. Uh, so that's very transparent during the user journey. We will say, so it, is it okay if I share that with your uh, doc, uh, doc, doctor from, from where you work with? And then that's how we escalate care. Otherwise it's on the user to go seek for, tra for treatment. So that it, w w we basically follow the informed consent. If you're okay with it, then I'll do because it's sensitive information. Great, thank you. Thank you, Mariana. And I think you, you would um, also want to go through the questions. I think I missed some uh, interest, mm -hmm. interesting ones from Della Glee, uh, for example, if they can access smart, uh, without uh, smartphones, um, that would be also interesting to know. Um, mm -hmm. But for now, um, we're gonna thank, uh, I'm gonna thank Mariana and uh, move uh, on to our next speaker. By the way, Mariana, you can still uh, answer on the chat if you, okay. If you want. Okay, I'll continue with um, the Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Mariana. So um, now we're going to uh, go on with Vitus, and now I'm going to say the right initiative. So it's the midwife initiative, um, the midwife checkmate initiative that Vitus will be sharing with us. Uh, and without um, further ado, let's go with you, um, Vitus. Thank you so much for joining. And Vitus, by the way, is from UNFPA um, in Ghana. Ay, no, perdóname. No. Um, Vitus, you're muted. Hello, everyone. Good afternoon. Good morning, wherever you are. Hello, hello. Good morning. Hello, can you hear me now? Yes, we can hear you well, Vitus. Thank you. All right. Thank you so much, and um, thank you, uh, my co-presenters. Um, the my presentation is uh, the title of my presentation is promoting respectful maternity care in Ghana: the midwife checkmate initiative. Um, this is um, a digital solution that was developed in re to, to respond to a call for bold innovations to end preventable maternal deaths, and uh, we are in the process of actually testing this. Um, and so um, we do not have the experience um, as others have had um, actually uh, going into the field to test the, the, the product. But it's a brilliant idea that we think that uh, um, members in this uh, meeting would, would like uh, to listen to and may be interested in. And so without wasting much time, I'm going to start um, the presentation. We all know that um, um, maternal mortality is still quite an issue, and uh, the United Nations Population Fund uh, was one of the key aspirations is to end preventable maternal mortality um, by the year 2030. Here in Ghana, um, our maternal mortality ratio is still quite high, it's at 309 um, per 100,000 live births. However, give this due to various uh, initiatives and interventions, uh, including a free maternal health initiatives, national health insurance that was introduced by the government of Ghana with the support of partners, including UNFPA, and natal care rates are quite really high. Um, so you have many people, many uh, women attending antenatal care, at least the four, um, uh, four uh, important antenatal care visits. And um, the skill delivery is uh, improving quite, um, quite uh, significantly. We are now around 74%. Uh, 
However, if you do a disaggregation of this data, you will realize that in certain parts of the country, um, including the, the region where we are focusing this solution, is the northern region, skill delivery is very low. It's about 35%. That's about half or less than half of the national average. Now, several factors. Uh, there have been various reasons why we have very low skill, skill delivery. Um, why we may will prefer to deliver in the house with the assistance of a traditional bev attendant, for example, rather than delivery in the, in the health facility where they could be given the needed care. And one of the key barriers is the negative attitude of health providers um, towards um, women who visit health facilities for, for to deliver or to give birth. Now, we all know that the mistreatment uh, during childbirth uh, in all these forms, whatever, whether it's physical, it's verbal, whatever, is a violation of the rights of women. And um, it has various consequences. It could lead to mistrust in the healthcare system. Um, you know, it sometimes can really deter women from accessing delivery um, care um, from the facilities. Now, um, what informed the, our decision to come up with, with uh, this, the famous uh, midwife checkmate is the fact that uh, mistreatment is really, really very common. I mean, uh, we have a good number of ladies who are here um, they would probably attest to the fact that this is something they've heard from a colleague or have experienced themselves in one way or the other. Now, WHO indicated that women were at the highest risk of receiving physical or verbal abuse between 30 minutes before birth and sometimes even up to 15 minutes after birth. And I actually called specifically for interventions around the maltreatment of women at the time of delivery. Now, in Ghana here, several studies have also shown that uh, this is a very common, common phenomenon at the health facilities. About 85% of women who were interviewed actually said that they've experienced one form or another of a mistreatment. Now, prior to, um, uh, and as part of the work we do at UNFPA, we try to also pick uh, the views of our targets, our beneficiaries. And so we did what we call the user research. And uh, I just pick one of the quotes here. Um, the incidents are devaluing and dehumanizing to our sense of dignity. And what it means is that even our rural women are also shared and they are, they are part of, of, of the story. Now, even if you look at the flip side of it, um, uh, the midwives themselves sometimes try to justify why they do these things and they attest to the fact that it's really, it's really happening. And this is one of the quotes. I hit in between the ties up, the ties open up. That's the only time I hit the patient and it's not hitting, deliberately hitting the patient. Sometimes you would have to tie those who are aggressive, yes, you have to tie them to the bed. Now, tying them to the bed, you, you can employ various means. Maybe you slap hair or something like that. Say, please, can you lie down? But she's in pain. Probably that's why she's not um, lying down as she would waist. But is that the right way to do it? And so mistreatment is common, and um, the need for respect uh, intervention to address uh, uh, abuses at the health facility is very glaring. Now, why are we looking at um, respectable maternity care uh, now that we are all uh, uh, affected by COVID and everybody is uh, really, really uh, concerned? Because COVID is, is, as we all know, is actually affecting everything, including our healthcare system. So the healthcare system is getting overwhelmed, even in most parts of the country, part of the world. Our healthcare providers are, you know, stressed. They are asked to respond to COVID emergency, you know, support the uh, COVID emergency response. They sort of actually performing their routine duties, um, including taking care of pregnant women and women who have come to deliver. Also, our pregnant mothers are afraid of contracting the virus because everybody now they, they already there's this fear of, of being treated anyhow at the facility, and then, and then when when this came up, there's this thing that oh. Um, so when I go, it's the, the mistreatment is going to get worse, and maybe I will even contract the virus. So we are beginning to see that uh, service uptake is, is, is reducing, and that is a worry to us. So we, we thought of this um, idea of, of an app, and I'm going to talk about that briefly. But, but we think that our innovation is timely uh, because um, it is technology driven, and, and, and most of our healthcare providers use a smartphone. I mean, 95, 99% of them have phones. And, um, you know, as, as I will talk about in the next few slides, it's going to be a cartoon app. So there's a fun aspect of it. And people won't relax after all the stress. So they play on the phone with a certain, you know, cartoons, videos, and all of that here and there. And that cartoon video also try to help 
you know, the, the, the interaction would also educate, provide them with some, some information and then, and things like that. So we think that is really, really timely now to think about something like this and to really put it in use. But also that we, we are involving everybody who, who matter in this, community members, National Midway Free Council, who are actually the regulators when it comes to midwifery Free Training, and also the midwives themselves. Now, as you notice in the, in my, uh, the next few slides, the, the, the solution, the midwife checkmate has a motivational component. And I think that this time we need to motivate the midwives because you are supposed to uh, perform your routine duties. You are supposed to, again, still respond to COVID-19 and all of that. So some, some form of motivation is very important now to keep the person um, um, working and to be able to ensure that the sacrifice as they always, always go. So what is this um, midwife checkmate we've been talking about? Um, um, So the midwife checkmate um, um, is, is, as I did mention, is um, what's happening. A midwife checkmate is an interactive cartoon app. It's an application that um, is going to be cartoon based. So we would use it to engage uh, midwives to provide respective for maternity care. We are going to do what we call a co-creation with, with, with various stakeholders. We are not going to develop this in our office as UNAP office. We are applying the bottom-up approach to developing this using human-centered uh, design processes. So we co-created with women who have recently assessed skilled delivery care, pregnant women, midwives, nurses, and midwife freelancers, so that the product that we come out with is going to be acceptable to everybody, the issues that, that exist. Are going to be uh, captured in and is going to follow the right uh, the protocols and, and policies that govern healthcare delivery uh, in this country but also even beyond. Now it's our future uh, customer care information, patient rights and others. It's important for uh, our midwives to you know they know this through their training but a form of refresher to tell them that a pregnant woman have the right to you know not to be beaten or slapped at when she's in pain and things like that. But also importantly, we are looking at questions about particular betting scenarios and multiple answer options. That will show you acceptable and unacceptable, unacceptable responses. And depending on what you select, the, 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 the apps should tell you that this is not the right way to respond. For example, the, the midwife who said that she, she was aggressive and needed to you know, put her to the bed. There are ways to do that. If you tap her at the back and say, oh, madam, please, can you lie down, things like that, rather than pushing her and slapping her. So those sort of things are going to, you know, intuitively change somebody's behavior um, in a way, because when you go to the facility and you encounter something similar to that, you're like, oh, ah, when I was playing this uh, cartoon app, uh, I, I selected this and this is what they said. Can I try the options that were uh, given me by the, the app and things like that? But also we are going to go beyond that to go into the communities because we think that community ownership, um, community participation is important in public health and in healthcare delivery. And so we still collect stories, um, business scenarios, experiences, we'll go back to the community, share with them, and also listen to their perspective. And, and in a way, if we have positive stories, uh, very positive stories, we are going to motivate because community people talk to, you, to each other. We are going to uh, motivate more women to attend to, uh, to visit healthcare facilities to deliver when, when the time is due. And then, like I said, we have a, a component we call the Midwife of the Season Award. And uh, already globally, we celebrate the International Day of the Midwife, where in Ghana here, with the support of UNAP, we provide uh, some support to Ghana Health Service uh, to provide awards to outstanding midwife. And there are various uh, processes that they go to to select one of them, or the numbers they will, will always provide award to. We're looking at this one being instituted as something that um, uh, every year we can give awards to, to women. And I think that when, when midwives get to know that this package is there, they will always try to, you know, do their best um, to ensure that the, the, they are also uh, giving some of their work. Now, it has various features. We shall have a, a profile of uh, midwives, we shall have a chat room, um, you know, that's brought to record activities. We shall have animated scenarios, you know, some analytics, but we are looking more uh, ambitiously of also having it offline so that when you download it, you have it on your phone, issue of internet connectivity should not become a challenge for midwives to use it. Um, now, what do we expect? Um, as I said, this has been is, um, working at actually testing it, but the, I, I, I left out the processes because um, of time, but we would 
develop it, we'll do a prototype, we'll test it, we'll get back to our users, we'll give you the feedback, we'll revise it, we'll go back to community and things like that. And then we'll come up with a product that is acceptable to everybody. But we are hoping that um, we will be able to improve the knowledge uh, and attitude and promote some positive attitude of midwives um, towards caring for pregnant women. Because as we said, it's a form of refresher, but it's also fun for, you know, it's full of fun. And then you look at scenarios that are real. I mean, real life scenarios that we are going to put in there. And so attitude would probably change, uh, most likely to change towards um, ensuring compassionate care, sort of very abusive care. And when that happened, um, there's going to be the, uh, uh, our women would probably have some trust in our health system. And when there's trust, they're likely to patronage the, uh, um, you know, skilled delivery care. Because we all know that one of the reasons why um, uh, our women die is sometimes the decision they're taking and going to the hospital, um, you know, the three delays. And if we address the, the health facility level with, with something with, with you know, by promoting a positive attitude. And then also community people are motivated to go to the facility. I think that will, will go a long way to actually ensure that reduce uh, maternal mortality. But also that the reports that we get, the positive reports that we go back to the community to share about community, uh, about healthcare providers and what they are doing. And I can tell you that we have women who say that, oh, when I'm going to deliver, I would like Madam, Madam A, a uh, midwife A, to be at the facility. And sometimes they even call the person, when are you on duty so that I'll come and deliver? Because they trust that such a, a midwife is going to provide them with some compassion, it will support them and things like that. So it's not doing anything out of the ordinary, but it's just attitude. And attitude is really a very important determinant when it comes to uh, skill uh, delivery uh, or childbirth. And, and overall, at the end of the day, we, we will likely reduce the maternal mortality to do this very novel um, innovation. I thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Vitus. This, this is an amazing app, and I, and I particularly love the, love the cartoons and how interactive it is. Um, and I'm going to join some of uh, the people in the chat um, thanking you all for the, for the presentations. Um, Vitus, I would also like to, to invite you to share your contact details, if you can, on the, on the chat. Um, that would be great for people to, to write follow-up questions. And in the meantime, um, we can cover, I think, a, a couple of questions uh, that we have here. Uh, some of them are on training. How do, how do you train the midwives to use the app? Um, there is another one. If there is a, a success story regarding the midwife's checkmate. Um, and um, I, I think that uh, so maybe you can, you can start with us, with those. Um, and I think they ask the same questions as before, as in how, if they don't have a smartphone, are they able to access this, this um, uh, initiative? So um, I'll turn it over to you and maybe we are gonna run out by, uh, in a couple of minutes, but um, please go ahead, Vitus. Uh, it's unfortunate time is running out, but um, yes, um, the trainees are going to be um, uh, done, um, virtual because uh, we, 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 we want to ask, I mean, technology is helping us a lot to be able to do a number of trainings virtually. I mean, we are already supporting the Ghana Health Service to do some uh, electronics uh, trainings and all of that. But in Ghana, we have also, the government have given us uh, have sort of easy restrictions. So we're able to meet 100 midwives. Um, and also the midwives are, you know, part of the essential uh, health providers. So they are at post. So we're going to be able to have the trainings done for them, um, either to virtual means, but also even meeting them in, in smaller in smaller numbers. Now, in terms of smartphone, I I I we don't have empirical evidence to say that um, every midwife have, but I can tell you that in Ghana, almost every midwife do have do have a smartphone because um, I mean. Um, this is something that is within their means and they really use it a lot. Even if in, some of them access their pay slips and all of that, pin numbers and all of the through the smartphone. So yes, that is something that we can, uh, we, can uh, we are not um, going to be so much affected um, uh, uh, with. Um, somebody said, uh, in terms of research, how many um, uh, did we do, how many people did we uh, interview? Well, this was not, it's not um, um, a research that was done to kind of uh, generate uh, evidence that we can generalize for everybody. That's why it's a qualitative study. 
uh, we interviewed about 20 people uh, in the rural community in northern region and uh, we picked up just to confirm the, the studies that, that have been done about mistreatment and the fact that it's a common phenomenon. I am going to uh, go out and share my uh, email address. I just put it here. Um, if anybody wants to reach out to me, please kindly do so. That's great. That's great. Thank you, Vitus. And um, thank you, everyone, for joining. I agree with all of you on the chat. This has been uh, an amazing uh, room with great presentations, very inspiring and very um, res and responding very well to, to, this, uh, to, to this crisis in COVID, during COVID-19. So thank you everyone for joining. Um, as, we, as we were saying, this is, this, is not the end of the, this is the end of this conversation, but hopefully not the, not the end of the interactions between the people here. So thank you for the presenters, um, to the presenters and to sh uh, for sharing your, your emails. And please continue to interact. Thank you.